Thank you very much, Jane. Um, uh, I, I'm one of these people who did a, a 20 minute talk mistakenly, so there's a couple of slides I'm going to have to gallop over, but uh, uh, hopefully we won't miss too much. What I'm going to do is I, I'm going to uh, just talk a little bit about the context of this project, the research context, uh, hopefully tell you what we did and why we did it. And then because it's an immersive experience and it's very difficult to explain an, an immersive experience kind of verbally, there's actually a little video which is captured basically from one person's point of view inside that experience, which is about four minutes long. So hopefully I'll have time to show that. And uh, then uh, very briefly, I've got some reflections at, uh, at the end of that. So the first thing to say in terms of context is that I've been really interested in this relationship between materiality and the digital for quite a long time. Uh, and we know, just as we've been talking about how there's a, a preference for the visual or the ocular in Western societies, we also know that heritage terms people are very interested in, in the real, original, material objects. Uh, and that applies even in the weirdest of circumstances, which is why I have this slide here, which is, a, which is an object of the Utah teapot which was one of the very first objects that was ever rendered in 3D. The least important thing about this teapot is its physical materiality. But still, there's a museum that's actually gathered this $5 teapot together and put it on display because they feel that's what people would be interested in. So I've carried on uh, looking at multiple ways in which we can engage people using through uh, um, uh, networks and relations in particular and co-production in particular how we can engage people uh, in multiple ways, including emotionally with the 3D content that we're generating. I had mentioned two projects in particular. One is uh, uh, the Accord project, which took place a few years ago, which involved 10 novel groups generating uh, 3D models using photogrammetry, but also uh, we used RTI uh, of, of objects for significance to them. And this has been kind of followed on by another project called Scotland's Rock Art Project, which is again working with large networks of people in this case, uh, avocational archaeologists, and we're recording about two and a half thousand uh, rock art sites around Scotland, generating three-dimensional models from them and then posting them, posting them up. And that's actually a longitudinal survey because we're really interested in, in how people's responses, both to rock art and uh, the, the technologies and the, and the digital objects that are being generated, how those uh, uh, responses change over time. Um, I'll skip over that. Again, for context, Sadly, I have to say that the, the main, one of the main buildings for the organisation in which I work, <coughs> the Macintosh uh, building, designed by uh, an internationally significant architect, certainly Scotland's most uh, significant architect, Charles Rennie Macintosh. Unfortunately, this uh, suffered uh, a very serious fire in 20, 2014. And we have uh, a, a rather nice laser scan, uh, which was generated in the immediate aftermath of the fire. Uh, and one of the really nice things about this particular image uh, is, that, oh, is that we can see, I think, I hope if I can find the pointer bit, that's it. We see there's these figures here, these kind of ghostly figures which are uh, appearing uh, in, in the scan. These are actually scans of the plaster casts that were used for teaching drawing inside the building. Uh, and here's another uh, uh, image of those plaster casts. So we, we engaged in a full laser scan survey immediately after the fire. Uh, and there we have what's actually a very well-known sculpture indeed. This is the Leo Quan. So if I if had loads of time, I would love to give you an art historical appraisal of, uh, of the Leo Quan. Honestly, I would. Yeah, maybe not really. The important, <laughs> the important thing about this particular sculpture, I think, from our project's point of view and from my research point of view, is that already the Leo Quan that was discovered in 1506 uh, is actually a copy. There is probably a bronze original. The version that we have inside the Macintosh School of Art is also a copy. It's a plaster cast copy. This is, a, this is a, an object with a very interesting and long biography where there has been copies of copies of copies made over a long period of time. So that's kind of context. We then go on to, I think, the uh, Julian mentioned, that, that a lot of the papers in this uh, session today have been prompted by a particular call on immersion from the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, where they were specifically interested in memory, place uh, and performance. And we saw, I think, an opportunity to participate in this call, uh, drawing together the things that we've mentioned in, in, uh, in the context slides here. 
The key thing, uh, what we were looking at, is, is looking at developing uh, a methodology for generating a kind of immersive experience that borrows on the co-production that we'd already been engaged with with community groups. And the communities that we were looking at in the Glasgow School of Art were these communities. The, the staff were a community, the students are considered a community, the archivists and the art historians, and also the architects involved in the reconstruction of the building were considered a community. And there is quite a large community of interest, or expertise in Glasgow itself around Charles Rady Macintosh, the, um, uh, the architect. So in our design process and our construction process, we borrow very, very heavily from these groups of people using the kind of focus group methodologies that have been developed through uh, Accord and Strat projects. Uh, that's, that's, that's the key element of it. The other key element I think is worth mentioning is that we had the opportunity to work with, a, with an SME called ISO Design. These are, these are uh, that's their logo down there. Um, they're a, they're a, a commercial design company who've done some extraordinary work, a award winning company. Uh, they've done work around the, uh, the Titanic exhibition in Belfast and also the 3D displays in, in uh, Stonehenge, the Stonehenge Visitor Centre. So they were really very, very good partners for us to uh, team up with. So what we wanted to do was to create this immersive experience using AR and VR techniques. There was a kind of iterative user testing process which actually took place after the co-production process. And there was this idea, which I might, if we've got time, return to, that we would create a, a set of preliminary industry standards for, for creating these kind of immersive experiences. So we have a, a, a linear VR experience, it's about five minutes, a little less than that actually. Uh, and the target for this was the reopening of the Macintosh building after its reconstruction in that 2014 fire. It was going to be an immersive experience, it was going to be part of a large exhibition around Charles Mayer and Macintosh uh, during the reopening uh, process, which would have been taking place around right now actually. Uh, so we would encounter various things, the history of the coon. We were quite interested in the, the, the various types of data that people wanted to be uh, embedded in, inside the, uh, uh, the immersive itself. History of the, the Leo Quan, its role as teaching aid inside the Macintosh, the art, art historical significance of the Leo Quan itself, the process of damage, and particularly the process of restoration actually, but a lot of people reference that as being extremely significant. Uh, and we also wanted to embed as a kind of uh, uh, it's a kind of embedded paradigm, actually, a kind of discursive element where we talked about the process of actually building the model itself and what that means in terms of the biography of the object mm -hmm. and the process of replication through time. Interestingly, and this I think chimes with uh, some of the other papers we've heard uh, over the last few days and also with the uh, Katz paper there, uh, all the communities we dealt with, all the people we discussed in the co-production process, were not in the slightest bit interested in the idea of a perfect visual representation of what the local was like inside the Macintosh building at the time. They realised that that would be, to a large extent, inhibiting, could simply be represented by a photograph in most instances. They were much more interested in bounding up lots of different types of stories and lots of different appreciations and very interested in something that would actually be emotionally resonant. So we have uh, I, we'll see this obviously, I won't go over this too long. There was historical co content in the, in the narration, lots of really interesting archival images going back about 100 years of it, where, where it was in the building, how it was being used. Lots of gaze activated content. This is a, a UI, uh, uh, but there's a discussion about the UI around there that I don't think we've got time for, but there was lots of interesting decisions about how people were going to interact with this immersive in the, in the easiest ways. But we shouldn't forget that the, 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 the exhibition for the opening of the Macintosh uh, is somewhat postponed mm -hmm. because unfortunately, during the reconstruction process, the Macintosh suffered uh, another absolutely catastrophic fire. So it's actually the worst situation that it is. And this happened while we were building an exhibition to discuss the reconstruction process after the first fire, and it all involved a certain reorientation of our process. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm aware I'm galloping, but hopefully we can get to reflections at the end of this. So I'm just going to play. Uh, so what we're seeing here is, it's a, it's a full immersive five Oculus Rift or so on. So what we're seeing is, is one person's perspective of this, of this experience. This is Leakowan. Legend has it he was a Trojan priest who along with his two sons 
was attacked by sea serpents sent by the gods. The story's most iconic depiction is a marble sculpture from ancient Greece that is now in the Vatican that many believe to be a copy of an earlier bronze work. You are looking at a plaster replica of the central figure that existed in the Glasgow School of Art's Macintosh building. From the time of its rediscovery, copies of Leakuan and his sons were made in marble and in plaster. Many were used for teaching drawing and anatomy in art schools where collections of casts were wheeled between studios for students to work from. As drawing from casts fell out of fashion, many were destroyed. At Glasgow School of Art, however, Leakuan and other plaster casts were retained and were familiar figures in the school's corridors. In May 2014, this cast was badly damaged in the fire that ravaged the west end of the famous Macintosh building. As if attacked by the gods again, the intense heat and smoke transformed Leakuan's marble-white plaster surface to a sooty, blistered black. A decision was made to conserve the plaster cast, given its importance in art education and also its history as part of the GSA collection. The first step was to examine Leakuan and establish how it was made so it could be strengthened. There was this moment when I was looking at them and they had become something else. They really, really had become something else. They were already stunning. To think people had cast these from amazing sculptures and they'd survived all these years until now, until this point. And then there was a fire and suddenly the fire had turned them into something completely different again. We didn't know whether he was solid or hollow. So we had to work out how is the consolidant gonna penetrate the plaster itself. We drilled holes into the Lao Kun's body. One was to allow the endoscope to go in so we could see all around the inside of the cast but then we could use the same holes to actually spray the consolidants. So we could use a, a tool to go through those holes. So we could use those holes for as many purposes as possible. And we could then check how the consolidation was doing with the endoscope. In terms of the conservation, in terms of the patina that the damage from the fire has lent it, what is just incredible here and absolutely magnetic is it's almost as if Leia Kwan or this copy of a copy of a copy has reverted to the original that has been lost to the midst of time. And so we have a slice of that original experience because this dark color is actually the pattern that the bronze would have assumed. The conservation work made value of Leakuan's transformation, preserving the surface like a darkened bronze. This beautiful copy, unique in its appearance, was stored in the Macintosh building because of its size and fragility. Sadly, it perished in the fire of June 2018. But does this mean it is lost? Our version may only exist in this intangible digital space, but could this be considered a faithful copy of the plaster cast? which was a copy of the Vatican marble, which was possibly a copy of a lost bronze. Our conserved Leakuan exists as point cloud data, and this can be transformed back into physical material through 3D printing. It can be rendered and textured in a limitless number of materials, rescaled or replicated infinitely. Would such an object be any less authentic than any of the other copies made over the past 2,000 years, in print, in sculpture, or in plaster? The Leakuan lives on. Okay, thank you very much for that. That's near, nearly perfect timing. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think I'm doing okay for time on. Yeah, you've got three, four minutes. Okay. Up. Okay, fine. So, uh, key findings of this, I think, uh, from from a from a design perspective, 
And again, I'm not sure this can be universalized, but actually this, the, the idea of combining uh, co-design with the rapid application development works really well in, in this particular instance. The stakeholder groups definitely felt a sense of ownership in the co-design uh, process and with the immersive. There was a, there was a moment when during the, uh, the, the, the kind of evaluation process, we were keeping, uh, we were keeping tabs on the number of people who burst into tears during the, uh, during the experience, which I think indicates some kind of strong emotional attachment. Organisational concerns, which always exist in this type of project, we were, we were able to address those very, very on. Um, and again, the iterative user testing, which I don't think is unusual or novel, but it was actually uh, uh, very extremely useful. So just a couple of minutes on, on where I think uh, we are, given the scale, the time scale and the amount of money in this project, I think there was issues that we didn't manage to address. Uh, and one of those, I think, uh, ironically, given how we just dealt with the sound there, is that the, the narration there is really useful in terms of delivering information, but it, it's potentially quite didactic and also potentially quite intrusive. So there's a wee bit of a division about people who wanted this type of uh, narration and people who would much rather have had a... There was sound effects in there. There was not spatialised sound uh, like Kat was talking about. But there was people who were much more in favour of simply having a much richer uh, soundscape. Um, there's there's practical issues with these immersives. Is the fact that you need to shepherd people around them. That you need to be followed around with somebody holding the cable behind you. Uh, and in an exhibition space uh, where it's been used by other people, we still have the issue of people um, spreading germs from each other's feces uh, and conjunctivitis, which is slightly problematic to say the least. Also in this one, I think it's fair to say that, that we have to spend, we have to think a little bit more about the transitions from these physical to virtual spaces. If you're in a big brightly lit room surrounded by lots of people uh, and then you drop into that kind of darkened, emotionally uh, evocative environment, it can be quite jarring and it may take you a little while to actually orientate yourself to this new space. I think we have to acknowledge that and I think one of the things we were thinking about in, in, in another context for another immersive is actually physically designing the space in which, case, in which the immersive takes place so the users kind of eased into the experience before they even put the helmet uh, on. Uh, authorship, which some of you know is a, uh, is, a, is a major kind of bugbear of mine, which is why we had the credits at the end there. In this case, they were still uh, obscured. The individuals who actually were involved in the creative process for all intents and purposes, artists in the art school are not named individually. The entire product is corporatized, and that has a, has a definite impact on the way that is consumed by the audience. It is not presented as a work of art, which, as we know, almost all works of art are explicitly offered and as part of how they're received. This is presented as a virtual experience, despite the fact that it's clearly uh, uh, informed by creative practice. Ownership, again, in this, this instance is unmentioned, but perhaps we don't want to open that uh, particular can of worms here, but how these things are licensed and made available. And I think it was also a key uh, missed opportunity, which I was advocating for, is that when we saw uh, the moment in the immersive when there was multiple copies of the lacoon appearing, this was, this was talking about the kind of, uh, the, our ability to, to replicate these things infinitely. I think we missed the opportunity to see that actually there already exists in the world a network of lacoons. I'm seeing lacoons again, but I've been told a million times it's Leo Kwan. Why can I not say that properly? It's Leo Kwan. There is a social network of Leo Kwans in the world already. This sketch lab is already full of three dimensional models because these plaster casts exist in museums uh, all, over, all over the world. It's, uh, there's obviously the, the, the original exhibit, it isn't original, and there's also a huge amount of quite interesting creative response to uh, the plants themselves. And taking a biographical approach of, a, of an object, I'd really like to have kind of drawn all that, uh, that into, the, uh, uh, into the process. So next steps, and I don't think we'll have time to talk about this, should you say no. <laughs> I just want that, that, this, uh, that one at the bottom there, I think is worth highlighting. It was a very interesting session that Sarah Perry and Rachel Opitz were, were running yesterday. I caught the end of it. Uh, about the potential for universalizing some of the kind of design lessons. And I have to say, I'm not entirely convinced that we're actually at that stage just yet. I think we're, we're at very, there is no vernacular for how we uh, engage with the MERSA the way there is, with, for example, cinema and so on. 